So thanks so much for joining our Trusted Sec Live webinar, Password Recovery 101, Cracking More of Your List. We'll be joined by Martin Boss, Hans Lacan, and Paul Ber uh, Berkland. Uh, my name is Nathan Knoll. I'm the marketing manager here at Trusted Sec. And before I kick it off to the rest of the team, just wanted to take a couple seconds here to talk about Trusted Sec in case you don't know who we are. Uh, we are a full service information security consulting firm. Here are just some of the services that we do, broken into a couple of different categories um, to help show how we uh, work with our partners and clients um, to improve their security through a variety of means. Um, one way that I think is helpful to kind of look at, at what we do in, in our approach to security is just showing how we can approach um, different security programs through building them, uh, testing a security program that may already be in place, or even then fixing the security program that's in place. And at any point, uh, our incident response team is available to come in, help out with any kind of breaches, incidents that may have occurred as well. A couple of things that, that we're really proud of is uh, that all of our engagements are, are led by senior level consultants. And, and our, these senior level consultants are all leaders and tool creators. Uh, as you're going to see here with the three consultants on our webinar today, um, they're all deeply involved in the security community, involved in writing their own types of blogs and demos and walkthroughs and tools, um, which, which means a lot to us as a company and something we found a lot of success with. Uh, and then lastly, we back them with a dedicated attack research team. So all of these leaders and creators have direct access to people who are on the front lines of looking at new attack vectors, looking at what the latest things that um, uh, attackers are using, and then the defenses um, to thwart them. So a couple of just quick housekeeping tools. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. So we will have the uh, recording available directly after this on our website. If you go to trustedsec.com, uh, find this event, you will see this recording available um, right after this. Um, it's also available on our YouTube, YouTube page along with all of our other uh, webinars, um, video blogs, and talks. And then finally, uh, highly encourage everyone, if you have questions, go ahead and use the Q&A function. Um, it should be in the, the Zoom UI and enter a question in there. Um, we'll do our best to, to take it as we're going. And then um, if not, we have time at the end to go through with it. Uh, so again, really encourage you if you have any questions at all, helps the discussion. It helps um, our panelists here to, to, to know what is working for everyone or what people have questions about. Um, so. After having said all that, I'm really excited to turn it over um, to the team here. We have um, lots of, of looks at tools that we use, um, look at Hashcat, and then live demos and walkthroughs. So I'm excited to see it. And um, with that, i uh, hand it off to Martin. All right, thanks everybody. Um, let me just share my screen really quickly. All right, great. So, um, you know, thanks everybody for, for joining us for our password recovery uh, webinar. We're gonna do uh, we're gonna do several of these. Uh, you know, it's a it's a much broader topic than uh, you know fits in an hour. So, uh, this is sort of our one on one series. Uh, you know, sort of introduction, getting getting started, and uh, and that kind of thing. So, we're gonna show you uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the basic functionality of of Hashcat. Um, there are uh, lots of other password recovery tools out there. Um, some of them are very good. Uh, we choose to use uh, Hashcat. Um, you know, Adam, the developer, uh, is, a, is a good friend of ours, and, uh, and we find it's the tool to be the most effective on pen tests. All right, so um, Nathan already went over it a little bit, but just so you know who is on this webinar, uh, myself, Martin Boss, I'm the VP of the consulting services here. So uh, I've moved into more of a sort of a management type role. So I'm sort of doing the, uh, the, the, the overview here and, uh, and Hans and Paul are, are going to do the, uh, the technical stuff. Uh, so Hans Walken is a senior security consultant and Paul Berkland is also a senior security consultant with uh, Trusted Sector. 
Um, just because we get this question all of the time, anytime we do one of these, I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way. Um, the hardware that we're using for the demo here um, is a, uh, you know, is a 4U rack server. Um, it holds eight Titan cards in it. Uh, it has 64 gigs of RAM and dual Intel Exeon CPUs. Um, so, so that's the hardware that we're going to be demoing on. Um, and here's a little example of the speed that we're going to be working with. It's obviously GPU accelerated. So, you know, hash mode 1000 is, is NTLM, which is basically, you know, as far as pen testing goes, that, you know, the hash that we run into the most. So, uh, so this is just a little showcase of the, uh, of the speed that we'll be working with, but you'll also see it uh, in some of these demos that we do. So one thing that I always like to start with, uh, you know, before we even get into the Hashcat tool specifically is identifying the type of hash that you have. Um, so in some situations, this is very, very easy, right? You uh, compromise a domain controller, you know, uh, dump the hashes from there. You know, we all know they're LM and NTLM uh, and, and that kind of thing. Um, however, there are a whole lot of situations where it, it can be really difficult to find out the actual, uh, you know, hash of the, to find out the type of hash that the password is. So um, there are a couple of ways that you can do this. Um, this comes out mostly in our app testing. So lots of times when we're looking at uh, proprietary applications or, you know, applications where, you know, somebody has created some you know, module to join two stacks or something like that. A lot of time we find, you know, obscure passwords and we're not sure, uh, you know, what type of, uh, what type of algorithm it is. So um, this is one thing that I always like to touch on in the, in the very beginning. So there are several tools uh, for this. Um, Hash ID is the one tool that, uh, you know, that, that we use frequently. Um, the, the thing to remember uh, about about trying to determine the hash that you have is that a lot of these tools work on the length of characters in the hash or you know some other uh, thing like that. And so some of some of these hashes have uh, you know be just because of the length could be multiple different hashes. So you can see here in my you know in my screenshot that I gave you know I gave the tool this hash and and while it didn't tell me exactly what hash it was, it did narrow it down to nine choices you know, from the, you know, 220 or so uh, choices that Hashcat can use. So this gives me a little bit more information to search for the type of hash that I have. And it can also, so, so context is really important, right? So oftentimes when you get it out of an application, there'll be context, uh, different versions of Linux, uh, you know, they've changed the hashing algorithm over the years. Um, so looking for that dollar sign one or dollar sign six or one of those things that, uh, you know, that a Linux login hash uh, begins with, you know, those are all context clues to help you determine the type of hash that you have. Um, so same deal here. Uh, when all else fails, um, you can actually go for a manual hash identification. So on the Hashcat wiki, um, you can see right here that, uh, that each of the hash modes is listed. So the hash mode is what you need for, uh, to tell Hashcat what to do, and we'll get to that. And then there's the type of hash, and there's also an example hash here. So you can take your hash and manually go down this page and, and try to locate something that's at least the same length or, or looks like it or something along those lines. The ones I get tripped up the most with are these MD5s with the password and the salt and all of these different iterations. So uh, we see those a lot in applications and those are the ones that, uh, that trip us up quite a bit. All right, Hans, I'll turn it over to you. All right, and so as Martin had mentioned that the tool that we use a lot is Hashcat and Hashcat has a lot of switches or options that you can use. Um, we're not going to go through all of them today on this call, uh, but the ones I think that are most important is going to be the attack modes. Uh, we have five that are listed here and each attack mode has its own trade off. Um, sometimes some will be quicker. Some will uh, take more disk space or use different types of resources. Uh, the one that we're going to start off with is attack mode zero or a dictionary attack. 
basically what a dictionary attack is, is you're taking a set of words that's a line or new line delimited. So each line has its own possible candidate and it's called a word list for nomenclature. And you submit that to Hashcat. And then with the algorithm that he's specified, it'll take each of those entries and compare between the two. Does you know this match or not? Uh, this is a very boring attack because it's very straightforward and it tends to take up a lot of disk space. People have collected different word lists uh, through different, uh, from different engagements um, over the time. And you know, some of them are good. You know, Rocky is a very common one, but they do end up taking up a lot of space. So what I'm gonna show here is an example of one uh, based off of our uh, hashes that we've already come from, or that we've already obtained. So we're gonna hand wave how we got these hashes. But if we look here in our directory, we have a single file here called example DC. And if we do a uh, head on that, we can see that we just have a series of hashes listed in here. And if we go to our word lists, head word lists, we can see possible candidates for those. So the command that we'd wanna run in order to check those word lists or the, the entries in that word list against our hashes, again, we're hand waving how we got it, but we know that it's gonna be NTLM will be this command here which I think is a little big on the screen. Okay, so hash cap. Now the attack mode is A0. The mode is 1000 and that's the uh, NTLM hash that we have here. Now this switch we haven't really talked about, um, but basically we're disabling the pop file. Uh, and that's just only for demonstration purposes. In a real engagement, you want to keep that enabled so you retain uh, the, the work that you've done with a pop file. Uh, the name of the file that contains all of our hashes is next. And then we specify the word list that we want to use against it. Last one here, if you want to save your results, you have a dash O and the name of the file you want to save it out to. Uh, if you just want to see it print out to screen, you can do that too, by just not, re not saving it and hit enter. Now what's going to do here is it's going to go ahead and uh, queue up a few things. It's going to take the word list that we specified, load it into memory, take the hashes, load it into memory, um, warm up the GPUs and other fun stuff. And as we see, it's already completed quite quickly, you know, less than 30 seconds. And if we look at the results here, we've already recovered, you know, 1,500 out of almost 14,000. So it's, a, it's an effective uh, approach, but it's not, um, no, not very sexy, not, not uh, it's boring is what it is. The next attack mode that I wanted to cover here is attack mode three. And this is a brute force attack. Uh, what this does is it iterates over possible combinations, uh, starting with one character, then two characters, then three characters. And it's very lazy, uh, similar to dictionary, but it does go over a larger set of possibilities. Um, it takes a longer amount of time, um, and it's generally good for situations where you have smaller passwords. So an example of this, is this is here. And I'll show you on the screen what that looks like as well. So again, attack mode, this time it's going to be three versus zero. We're still using the same NTLM. We're just saving our pop file and then the name of the hash. Or the name of the file where the hashes are stored. And unlike a dictionary, which will end at the end of the dictionary when all the possible candidates are completed, this will just continuously grow and grow and grow. So it's, it just, it doesn't end. Um, and this is going by a lot quicker, but we can see that, okay, we're going through, uh, sorry, it's almost going by too quickly, but we have what, eight characters, different eight character combinations. Pause it real quick. Yeah, so right now we've already incremented from one character, two characters, three characters, all the way to eight characters. Now, um, we're going to get into this into masks, but basically it, what should be pointed out here is it's not trying all possible combinations of eight characters. It's using different character sets. So what does this actually mean, the question mark L, question mark D, question mark U, and so forth? And why are we trying this one versus the other ones? Well, that moves on to our next subject, which are masks. Now. If you don't know, you know what the password is, but you have an idea of what the key space or what characters might be, 
you can formulate what's known as a mask to then try different combinations or possibilities based off of those character sets. Um, this is a way to reduce trying every possible combination. For example, there's low likelihood that every password is going to be all symbols, all lowercase. You might want to, you know, change it up a bit. So masks let you do that. And here's a great link for, your, for more information about how to, uh, or to learn more about masks. But by default, Hashcat has character sets that are predefined. The Question mark L is in reference to all lowercase characters in the English alphabet. U is for all uppercase, D is digits, S is symbols. A is a combination of lower, upper, digit, and symbol. And then if you really want to get kind of fancy, you can go after um, the whole hex character space. Um, this is for situations where you know people have umlauts or other special characters that are not common in English language. Uh, this obviously will take a longer time to use passwords with that. Uh, whereas lowercase will be quicker. So as an example here, here's a pass, uh, if the password is password one exclamation point, and you wanted to build a mask that would cover that password, you do something like this, question mark is U for uppercase, lowercase, 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 digit, and symbol. Now when you try a password or a crack with this, it's going to try all uppercase, all lowercase, all digits, all symbols. So it's going to try every possible combination, but it's going to be more likely, but it would eventually hit this password here. You also can define your, cast, uh, your character sets. So as an example here, um, if you do use dash one to get your custom, custom character set, and then uh, for example here, you can have question mark digit and then A, B, C, D, E, F as your custom character set of one, uh, the custom character set. And then you can then, uh, append that onto your mask that you want to end up using. So say, for example, for our password here, instead of doing uh, uppercase for this password, you can build a custom character set that just has capital P and lowercase p. And now you're only trying those two possible combinations there. So here's another example. Um, if we had a mask of U, L, 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 D, D, S, the green rows are ones that it would eventually match. The red ones would be the ones that they don't match. So for example here, because this doesn't have an uppercase, it would not catch this password here. Now this, like I mentioned, um, is a great way to kind of fine tune from over brute force, but it does take some time. So if you want to calculate how long it takes for a mask to run, what you would do is you take all possible combinations and then multiply them together divided by the actual benchmark. So for example, uh, if we had wanted, let's say we had a password welcome one, or we wanted to crack something, make a mask that would match password one, or welcome one, sorry. The mask that you would use is upper, lower, 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 lower digit. The possible combinations is this here, the 26 multiplied by 10, which gives you about 80 billion possible combinations. You take that and divide it by your benchmark. Um, this benchmark layer was, oh, was run before we kicked everyone off the cracker. So it's a little bit slower. However, the results here is about a half a second to go through this entire key space. Emphasis of this here is great for when you're working with your, um, your employees and you wanna explain why welcome one's a bad password. Well, here's why. Um, additionally, elongating or adding more characters increases the complexity here exponentially. So that's why we tend to encourage longer passwords versus tacking on a symbol or changing a letter to a number or things like that. So I think we have a, an example of that here, of what that looks like. Let's go finish up. So um, we have A for attack, three, attack mode three, uh, 1,000 for the again, but then uh, here's the mode that you just or the the mass they put on here, and we have the upper lower 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 digit, and then the output to a file. So if we go ahead and run that, and it's already finished. Now I should mention that while our metric here was faster in the previous screen, 
we, or we reference that would be faster. It actually took longer for Hashcat to load up all the information than it took to actually crack it. So this is, again, an example of why uh, small passwords and lengthwise are bad. Um, you can also do a combination of masks and words. So say, for example, the password welcome, uh, you want to try all combinations of welcome, but then you want to increment digits of one, two, three, four. Well, you can do that by just saying welcome uh, in the digit or password and then a symbol, so like password exclamation point and so forth. Another common one that we like to see, or something that we do see, is ones where we have the company name and then followed by some digits, maybe uh, trusted sec one, trusted sec one, two, three, and so forth. And then lastly here, uh, we're going to talk about this, but the common mess that we tend or that we usually run into here are listed here. And this is based off of just going through analysis of uh, previously cracked passwords where the most common are the first character is usually uppercase and then the last character is either going to be a digit or a symbol. And this dovetails into the next section here, which is uh, attack mode six and seven hybrid attack, which I believe is Paul. Paul? All right, should be here now. Um, so hybrid attack modes, uh, there's two of them, and they're basically uh, a mask attack plus. It's, it's a dictionary attack and a mask attack. And uh, what Hans was just going over with where you can put in a word and uh, append a mask to the end, this is basically it, but with a word list in place. Um, so you have a dictionary on one side and you, put, you uh, insert a mask on the other. Uh, here you can see example mode six uh, has the appending of digits there. Uh, so it's using the 500 worst passwords.txt and we're going to append four digits to it there. Uh, the other mode that goes in hand with this is mode seven, uh, which is the prepend version of this. Uh, so we can take a look here and see kind of what our results would be if we were to run something like this. Jumping back over here. Uh, so again, we're disabling the pot file because we just want to see what the results are here. Normally you would not do that because uh, with unsalted hashes, you want every one that's been cracked to also be checked uh, just so you're not duplicate or so you're not missing out on any that you've already cracked or solved. Uh, so here we are, we're using attack mode six and we're using just uh, a, a small word list called english.txt. It's just uh, English words. And here we're going to append two digits with the question mark D's. So we're gonna let this run. And uh, some of these more simple mask attacks are actually gonna be likely covered in different rule sets, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but it is useful for examining uh, specific combinations, doing uh, just append appending numbers, for instance, is a great one, uh, appending years. Um, so you can see here, this is kind of what we, what we solved, welcome 26, welcome 34, that, that variety uh, word and two numbers. So moving back over here, Let's take a look, uh, recap of the masks that we talked about. Um, the ones that we usually use, yeah, would be, I, I usually use A, S, and D uh, for the most part, um, just for appending or prepending to passwords. That seems to work pretty well. Um, obviously, the more characters you put in, the longer it's going to take. One of the things that Hans was talking about was uh, the time involved. So as you approach maybe eight or nine on this rig, it starts to take a little bit longer and that goes up significantly with each character set, with each character that you add. And then depending on the character set that you're using, that can go up a lot. So if you're using the entire key space um, with, with the Bs option for all eight, that's gonna take significantly longer than using even the A option, which is also pretty slow. But um, so just keep that in mind when you're doing this, the more you tack on, the longer it's gonna take, obviously. Uh, so. I like to use this for adding years. Um, here you can see, instead of doing all Ds, you can actually use this attack with, uh, by giving a dictionary, a word list, and then even inserting two static numbers like the two zero. Uh, so you're not going through all four digit combinations necessarily. You might just wanna uh, focus on the years that were around or 19 and then two digits. Um, and then here you can see, you can also prepend here uh, just by putting it in front, uh, 
question mark D, question mark D, that'll add two numbers to the front. Um, it's useful when you've identified patterns in your hashes. Um, and this is not the first thing I'll usually go to. Uh, I prefer rules for the most part, uh, but it is a useful tool and you should know how to use it when you're cracking passwords. So next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about the combinator attack. Now, this is a great attack method. Uh, it takes two dictionaries and it puts them together and that can have awesome results. It is a little bit more timely if, when you get into the bigger word lists, uh, but it, it's, it's really useful for getting some of those really hard to reach hashes. Um, here's some examples of what it would do, for instance, if you were to put two dictionaries together. So here we have, you can see it's just matching up one, one word from the left, one word from the right. Uh, and that's, those show some of the results that we're gonna get from doing this attack. Now, this, uh, it's, it's important to know what your word lists are when you're using this attack. Uh, if you have too large a word list, it's not gonna complete. And it, this is all gonna really depend on what hardware you have available. Um, so, I mean, attacks that we might run on this rig are not gonna be really feasible on some other rigs because you just don't have the horsepower there. It's, it's, it's gonna take too long. Um, so keep that in mind. I, I always go in and check and see when I start off a crack, how long it's gonna take. If I see, oh wow, that blossomed up to 17 hours, I'm probably gonna cancel that and try going with something shorter in the two to three hour range for, for doing my cracking here at Breach. Uh, because I like to kind of review the results and then move on. If, if, I, if I put in a, a job for 24 hours, and at the end of 24 hours, I don't have anything. I just wasted a lot of time. Whereas I could have been trying some smaller sets of rules, some you know different different tactics. Maybe I'll see one works really well, and I'll continue with that. Um, but so we're getting sidetracked here. Let's get back to the combinator attack. Um, so here I'm going to show. I'm going to pop over the terminal, and I'm going to show you the output from a combinator attack. So here again, we're disabling the pop file. This is attack method one and we're attacking the, the DC, the fake DC dump again. So here you can see on the right-hand side, I've taken wordless English and rock you. Uh, again, try not to get too big of wordless here because it's gonna really add up. Um, I kind of like to use a combination of short lists and long lists with these. Um, or even another thing you can do is to take rock you for instance and you cut off the last four letters of rock you and make what I call it a, a tail file. It's basically a, just the trailing four characters or five characters. And you make that into its own word list and you put that in with rock you. So you rock you plus the tail file, or you might move that tail file to the first position and use tail file and then rock you. Um, so you can do that with the beginnings too. It's really good for getting kind of human patterns real world patterns of what people actually use for, for the beginning and ends of their passwords, and then mix and matching it with, with another word list. Um, so again, you should know what, what kind of words are in your word list. Is it all uppercase? Is it all lowercase? Uh, those are important things to keep in mind when you're cracking passwords, because if this English, that text was all lowercase, for instance, uh, and I didn't know that, I didn't account for that, it's only gonna prepend lowercase ones. Uh, so that that would obviously miss a bunch of them. Here we're seeing a lot of uppercase and I'm not sure how it's gonna show up on the video stream because this is scrolling by at a really fast rate. Um, so it should be finished up here. We're just gonna cancel this. Um, so here you can see even at this short time, we've recovered a significant portion of them. 24% um, have been recovered and we canceled it 20 seconds into it. So this is a really powerful attack. Like I said, it really depends on what hardware you have available, uh, but it's it's definitely worth doing. Um, it'll get, like I said, it'll get those hard to reach hashes. That, so something you can do, like let's say, um, if my word list was all lowercase in the first for the first uh, portion for the English text, you can use some uh, additional rules here, and you can actually tell it to capitalize. Uh, and we're going to be talking more about rules here in the next section. But you can you could tell it to capitalize all the first letters. Uh, of the first word just by adding in this uh, dash J and C flags. Uh, so yeah, we'll be talking about that in the next, uh, in the next portion. And just for comparison, uh, this ends up cracking about 30% of this particular list compared to just Rocky on its own, which was about 10%. So definitely keep, keep this attack in mind. We got three times results 
just by uh, combining two dictionaries. All right, um, yeah, we've covered this. Great for longer passwords, but very time intensive, very fast. And we've talked a little bit about this. Um, don't use two giant word lists unless you got the hardware to back it up. Uh, you can use two small word lists twice. It's That's just as good. Um, and with that, you might want to pr uh, put on some additional rules. Like if I took the English twice, I might want to add on uh, a digit or two at the end. Um, you can do that with those with rules, which we'll be talking about here. Uh, and the rules can be applied to both the left and the right sides here. So. Here's an example of adding a rule to the left side and to the right side. So you can see the dash J is for the left and dash K is for the right. Uh, and it kind of uses uh, regex symbol, symbolism. Um, the dollar sign there means to append. So we're appending a dash to the left side. And then the dash K with the dollar sign bang at the end is saying we're gonna append an exclamation point to the right side. So you can see here that the output here reflects that. We have yellow dash car, green dash car, exclamation point. Uh, so you're just getting the two, the two word lists. And then once they're put together, the rules are processed. You get the dash put onto the first one and the exclamation point of the second one. So now let's talk a little bit more about these rules. Uh, rules are kind of like, like a programming language. Um, they follow some some regex type uh, functions. Basically, you can modify or manipulate any of the words that come in from a dictionary. Uh, you can you can rotate them all. You can add characters to the front or back. You can insert characters at different positions. Uh, and Hashcat does come with a number of these rules already. But let's take a look at kind of what they are. So. Here, here is an example from the, the Hashcat Wiki, the rules section of it. And it kind of gives you a list of everything you can do that with rules. And I mean, it's really just limited to your own creativity and how much horsepower you want to throw at it. Um, I think rules are fantastic for cracking. They're my preferred method for sure. Um, and it's my number one go-to. Sorry, here we go. So you can see a few more. Uh, where you're replacing characters at different positions, or even incrementing or decrementing um, ASCII values. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. Uh, so, taking a look at what a word list attack with, with rules looks like, we're going to pop back over to our terminal here. All right. So, right here, we're again disabling the pop file. Uh, example DC dump, and we're gonna use a, a word list called all words text, and we're just gonna apply a, a set of rules called best 64 here. Actually, before I do that, let's take a look at what's in the rules folder. Um, a lot of the names aren't gonna give you a whole lot to, as far as descriptors go. Um, it, they're just the names of the rules and you get more familiar with them as you use them. Um, you'll come to learn which ones are good combinations together, which ones are really long. In, uh, in fact, the Rocky one here shows you that's a 30,000 uh, line word uh, rule, but, and best 64 is 64 line, but uh, they are mostly not descriptive like that. So let's go back and put this back in here. And uh, when you're running, Stuff with Hashcat, the dash O option at the end will try to use OpenCL if it's available. Um, so you get a little bit extra performance out of it. We're gonna let that run. All right, you can see we're getting a wide variety of rules or of words returned here of hashes solved, uh, even more complex ones kind of like this. Uh, it looks like this one probably took the first part and reversed it back again, something like that. But yeah, so you're gonna get a wide variety with the best 64 rules. These are pretty well proven rules as far as uh, that they work really well. And here you can see uh, with this where you cover 15% there. Um, if you were to run that word list on its own, you get in somewhere in the range of 7%. So. Uh, 
it'll definitely increase the value of your word lists that you're using. And you're going to get a lot more out of your word lists. Um, it accounts for, it just, it's, rules are the most fantastic thing for cracking. I just can't say it enough. Um, let's move over here and, and we'll take a look at them a little bit more. Uh, so again, we, we want to be aware of your word list size and the rule size. So if you have a giant word list that's just basically a brute force of the whole ASCII key space in, in different lines, you're not going to want to use rules um, or not a heavy rule set at least. You're going to want, base, best 64 is a really lightweight one. That's, that's good. I like to run that first against anything. Uh, and with slow hashes, remember that this is going to make the time increase dramatically. So uh, slow hashes, I mean salted hashes. And specifically, I would say like, for instance, um, cache domain uh, cache domain credentials like MS Cache two, super slow. Um, another one would be uh, even care roasting uh, the SPN hashes that you get. Those are going to be pretty slow. If you were lucky enough to get a net, net NTLM v1 hash, that's pretty fast. But then again, you can there's other methods for defeating those. Uh, but yeah, net NTLM v2 slower. Um, yeah, these are best for NT hashes, MD5 hashes, any of the unsalted hashes that you have, that's what you're gonna wanna really hit hard with rules or really small word lists with, with a lot of rules. Uh, Rock U is a great option for using with rules because it's, it's relatively small. Um, but if you get into some of these bigger dumps that you can get on the, on, on the internet, then you might wanna restrict your rule usage a little bit. Um, so, and uh, again, it's important to know a little bit about your word list. Uh, is it capitalized? Is it lowercase? Because that's going to impact what rules you might want to apply to it, uh, especially with the dash J and C options. Uh, if you make your own word lists and you make them all lowercase at the end, then you definitely want to run through the dash J C option to capitalize those first letters of each line. Um, and rules are super powerful because you can implement them with multiple with other rules you can combine rules together so instead of the best 64 once we can run that twice in a row and we're going to get other uh, additional results from that and again this is going to make it take significantly longer because you're running the rule set against it and then it's applying the same rules again so just keep that in mind. If you have a pretty decent long time for your first run, uh, think twice before tacking that rule on again. Um, but again, it, password cracking, I think, is largely experimental to some extent where you're trying things out, see what your results are. If that's going to take too long, try a different word list. I mean, there's really no cost, no negative to, to trying things out with this, except for you might waste some time. So definitely, by all means, explore it. Play with different rule combinations and see what you can see what you can get. Um, I'm gonna we'll come back to this in a second here. We're gonna keep going because that's gonna be boring to watch go through. I think it's gonna take about a minute and a half, but we'll see. Um, so with rules generation, there's two main methods you can do it. So the first method would be uh, if you're analyzing your passwords that you've cracked, uh, human generated forms of, of rule generation. You're you're taking a look at the cracked passwords. You're identifying uh, patterns that you see in here because humans are really good at recognizing patterns. Uh, if, you, if you scroll through a list, you, you might say, oh, well, these, these all seem to have this at the end, or, oh, they're capitalizing these uh, characters here. Maybe the first two are capitalized. You know, you, just looking through the cracked results, you might notice things. And so it's really important as a reminder here to analyze your results. Whenever you're cracking stuff, look at what's being cracked, uh, think about it, and then think about how you might be able to apply some rules or make some own rules, or some of your own rules, to uh, help solve those types of passwords. Um, but also bear in mind that when you're doing this and you're creating rules based off ones you already have solved, you're really reinforcing those patterns and you might not be discovering some other new patterns that, that haven't been cracked by you because you're just examining the ones that you have cracked. So just keep, I mean, keep this in mind. Um, analysis is a huge portion of password cracking, I would say. So the next method to generate rules is gonna be machine generated ones. Now, Hashcat has some stuff built into it already that lets you uh, both generate rules and then figure out which ones of those rules work well. So you can see here uh, near the top, we have the generate dash rules equals 3000. Hashcat is just going to take three, it's gonna randomly generate 3000 rules and then run it against your word list. So uh, in the wiki, actually, they recommend, you know, if you're at, if you're at your end's, end of your wits and you're trying to 
come up with some way to, you know, maybe solve some additional hashes and just kind of throwing things up the wall to see what sticks. Try this, it can't hurt. Um, so that's gonna generate passwords for you, uh, generate password rules, I should say. Uh, and then this goes well with another part of Hashcat, which is the debug mode and where it'll match rules. So if, if a rule works for something and it, it solves the hash, it's gonna put that into a file. Um, you have to dedupe this file because it does it for every single match but it's a great way to build up a, a new rule list um, of, of rules that have worked for your, your hashes. So again, bear that in mind when you're making rules based off hashes you've cracked. Again, you're kind of reinforcing some of those patterns as far as it, yeah, you're gonna solve ones you've already cracked at least one of, but you might, not, you might be missing out on ones you've never cracked or if that makes sense. Um, so, those are those are the two main methods. There's also uh, PAC, Password Analysis and Cracking Kit. I think is worth mentioning here. Um, it's a it's a toolkit that will do character analysis, and you can actually create rules out of it. Uh, I've played with it some, and it, it works fine. It's it's another method to try, another tool in in your kit. Um, and and I don't have it written down here, but there's also uh, PIPAL. I <laughs> hope I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. P I P A L. Um, that will do character analysis. It's great for after you've cracked a bunch of passwords and you wanna be able to hand back, let's say an analysis of the cracked passwords. It, it'll tell you what were the length um, of different passwords cracked, you know, what was the most common length. Uh, it'll give you statistics about, you know, what percent were eight characters, what percent were nine characters, et cetera. Uh, it'll also tell you what ones meet the default Active Directory complexity rules. And uh, it'll also then tell you what some of the most common base words and the top passwords are. So it's a uh, P-I-P-A-L. Uh, if you Google for that, that'll come up. I don't have a link in here, but that's another great tool for just analysis, um, but not so much uh, rule generation. So, and if you're looking for rules, there's a bunch of them that come in with Hashcat and those are really great rules. Let's pop back over here. Um, so we, we got a few more by running uh, best 64 twice. It, the last one was, I I want to say it was 15% on the first one and now we're up to 28%. So, um, and you can see here, it's, it's nothing too crazy, nothing too different than what we had before, but um, by, by doing best 64 twice, uh, it was able to find some of those ones that were just missing the first pass. So definitely use multiple rules in, in tandem. Uh, you're going to get more cracking out of that. Now, going back to the rule sets that come with, uh, with Hashcat, let's take a look here. Um, so these are all great. I like RockU 30,000 a lot. I like uh, Hash Manager and the Password Pros one here. Uh, Dive is good, but it's slow. If you have a bunch of hashes um, and you want to, you want to just kind of run it out. Dive will get most, a lot of them, but it might take a few days to run. So it's, it's thorough, but slow. Uh, use it as kind of, a, I would use it as a last resort kind of. Um, best 64 is great. Uh, the toxic rule is actually really good too. I've been using that a bit lately. Uh, using toxic and best 64, for instance, those, those seem to work pretty well. Uh, so yeah, now if you're looking for rules, there's a number of places you can find them on GitHub. Uh, the, this last one here, actually, the one rule to rule them all is kind of a neat write-up worth looking through. Um, and actually, not listed on here, but CoreLogic actually had a bunch of Hashcat rules uh, that are also great. That they, they had a, that CoreLogic wrote rules for some, uh, one of the Crack Me If You Can competitions a number of years back. And it was my first introduction to rules and it just blew my mind that this was possible that you could do this. So um, definitely worth looking at too. Um, but yeah, these NSA rules, the hobo rules, this uh, third one is mine. Uh, it's got a number of different rules uh, derived from, from passwords or uh, patterns I've seen, uh, for instance, like address, making addresses out of, out of word lists. Um, like for instance, Birch or the word Birch would go to like 123 Birch Street or Birch Avenue, that type of stuff. Uh, the one rule to rule them all is a great write-up and they did some analysis. Uh, the NSA rules guy also did analysis um, which is a neat write-up, but yeah, the one rule to rule them all, definitely take a look at that write-up there. Uh, they kind of go through results of different rules against uh, a, a dump 
from uh, some database. So it's, it's worth looking at and you can kind of give you an idea of the success rates of different rules. Um, and for rule combinations, here's some of my favorite ones. Uh, best 64 twice is great. The rock you and best 64. You don't want to put in, again, too large of word or rules together because you're going to significantly in, in, uh, increase your time there. So just keep that in mind. Work with what hardware you have. Uh, and again, I like to try keeping my sessions down to kind of a smaller range uh, just so I can review the results and if something's working, continue on that path. But if it's not working, I don't waste any more time on it. So I, I like to spend two to three hours usually on a run. Um, if you're getting longer runs, you, you might get success. You know, you might get a cracks like near the middle of the rule set. But oftentimes these rule sets are weighted so that the best, most effective rules are near the front. So if you're if you're going to solve something, most of the time it's going to be near the beginning um, and less likely maybe near the end. Uh, but when you're mashing rules up like this, you might, you know, that might vary because you might be near the end of the best 64 rule for the first one, but near the front of the best 64 rule for the second one. So yeah, just play around with it. it it's really something that is kind of fun to find what works uh, with your hardware and your word lists. Um, again, selection really depends on the word list size. So if you're using like that English.txt, which is just English words with no numbers or anything at the end, I would run that heavily with rules. But if you're using something like the hashes.org has uh, lists of um, all the solved hashes that they have, you can you can grab those as plain text. If you have something like that that's millions of li mile or millions of lines long, then you probably don't want to run a bunch of big rules with it unless you have some awesome hardware. So again, just keep in mind, use what you can with your, with the hardware that you have available. Um, rules are a great way to do this. So with that, um, the team actually wrote up uh, a program called Hate Crack, and it goes over, it, it pre presents you with a number of options for cracking passwords. Um, so I definitely recommend this. If, if you like password cracking or you need to do it uh, for, for work, but maybe you don't want to necessarily get into the weeds with uh, the, all the command line uh, options, or even if you just want to you know, easy mode it and say, hey, I'm just going to run this quick crack quick to see what it comes out with. Um, this is a great tool for that. Uh, and uh, they have the pure hate methodology crack, which is awesome. Um, there's, yeah, there's a number of attacks in here, including the Prince attack, which we haven't spoken about here, but a Prince attack is basically a longer combina combinator attack. Um, so yeah, this uh, definitely check out hate crack. It, it's a great way to solve hashes uh, if you don't wanna mess with uh, trying out a bunch of different rules or, or modes. Um, so with that, I guess uh, if we have any questions, we can take those now. Yeah. I this is Martin again. I'm just going to jump right in. We had a we had a lot of questions in the in the chat, and uh, I guess I didn't realize that they uh, they they were private to the individual people. So so I'm going to try to address some of them. Uh, you know, a lot of them were around the masks, and uh, you know the masks are uh, you know they're like variables. If you have anything to do with you know programming, and and we really just kind of scratched the surface on the basics of these masks here. So a lot of the questions that we got were around tailoring the masks to like a specific password policy or um, something like that. So in this in the second version of this, you know, this is like you know 101, so to speak. So so all of these methods will get you know get you about 30 to 50 percent of the way through most you know, hash lists, you know, out of a domain control or on a pen test, that kind of thing. And so um, in part two of this, what we're going to do is the next step in, in this type of situation is to take the hashes that you have already cracked and do some analysis on them. And so, uh, you know, uh, Paul mentioned the PAC, the Password Analysis and Cracking uh, Toolkit, which was created by it was created by a guy named I Felix. It was actually the first year that we that we they ran the Crack Me If You Can contest. Um, that was written during the contest because um, we needed to do a lot of analysis on the passwords. And so, um, what that does is you can take an existing list of plain text passwords and turn that into a list of masks. So, in the same way that Han showed you how to use a single mask, you can actually create a file with as many masks in there as you want. And so you can run, uh, you know, Hashcat with that mask file against your word list. And so uh, those files are created based on analysis. So we're going to do a lot of that in the second uh, iteration of this. I'm going to I'm going to do a whole lot about 
uh, analyzing your password list, expanding your password list, you know, and getting up to that sort of 70 or 80% cracked. And then uh, probably the third version of this will be, you know, cracking the last 20% or, or something like that. Um, you know, a couple of other questions that we got were about foreign languages. Um, if you go, uh, you know, and I know this video will be available, but uh, one of the links that Paul posted was the NY, NYX Geek link. And I know Paul has a large list there of Unicode and um, different uh, language passwords. So, so that would be, you know, that, that's available. Um, you know, ev everything that we use is, are using here is, you know, free and open source and we're happy to provide uh, links to any of the items. So are, are, you know, any other, any other questions that we can answer? All right, great. Well, thanks everybody for, for joining us and we'll be having a second one of these, uh, you know, very soon and, and hope everybody else joins us again for that one. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks Martin. Thanks Hans. Thanks Paul. Appreciate everything. And um, yeah, looking forward to the, the next iteration of this. Thanks.